Hi, everybody. Welcome to another update from the World Health Organization on the COVID-19 response. I'm Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and we're so excited to have Dr. Ed Kelly here with us to give us an update. Welcome, Ed. Thanks very much, Donna. Great to be here again. Excellent. Well, let's just go ahead and get started then. Good. Well, thanks, Donna. And again, it's a, just a real pleasure to be here um, with the foundation. Uh, as I say every time, um, the foundation has been one of our real uh, partners on patient safety uh, in general, and in particular, uh, you know, in, the, in this COVID pandemic, um, to get the word out about key messages on not just on the the virus, but also all of the impact it's having on essential services and and the key considerations about how to keep health services safe in this uh, environment. So I'll go through a little bit of an update on the health services and system support to the COVID-19 response. So the key messages that, that we've always tried to push and our director general has always tried to promote is that, as he said, while we tackle the pandemic, we can't lose focus of other health issues. We must ensure the continuity of health services really, as he put it, now more than ever, we have a duty to give health workers safe working conditions as a particular uh, aspect within this uh, outbreak. And I know that's been a, a, one of the uh, big standards of the foundation and, of course, of patient safety and the general patient safety global movement around the foundations of how you deliver safe care. But never was that more apparent as it is, uh, as it is now. What I'd like to do is go through a quick update of the epidemiology of what that we're seeing globally, the resurgence of COVID and the possible implications for the flu season, and then a few updates on essential health services and, and the, the activities that are buzzing around the world uh, to try and keep that work going and keep uh, uh, colleagues uh, up to date, but also involved in all of the different partners uh, in different countries around the world. So the current uh, epidemiologic situation you can see here, uh, just in the previous uh, 24 hours, while it's um, really an eye-popping number, it's not the highest number that we've had uh, over the past number of days. Just over the weekend, um, uh, we had the highest 24-hour period we've had since the pandemic started on Sunday. Before that, the highest 24-hour period, the day before. The highest week we've ever had since the start of the virus was last week. So. In general, while of course it's difficult to compare case numbers uh, that we're seeing now to very early in the outbreak where we weren't anywhere near the, the number of testing, uh, the number of tests out there uh, being done, but uh, we clearly are not going in the right direction. You can see some of the numbers of the countries with the highest uh, number of cases in the previous uh, 24 hours, and this is as of October 19th, so a day or two uh, ago but a whole number of countries with very precipitous uptakes, uh, especially uh, in Europe. You can see also the uh, curve by uh, region um, in terms of uh, WHO's um, uh, work, the, the shape of the curve across the world is very different. And if people remember, we've had a lot of uh, different models put out there early on in the outbreak, not by WHO, but by a lot of very learned academic colleagues. And we're very grateful for that. Some of that we used in terms of our own surge calculators for health workforce or for supplies. But uh, all of them have a more typical first wave, second wave, which is a little bit what you've seen in the Western Pacific uh, shape to the outbreak. But none of the regions actually have a typical uh, outbreak curve. Normally you see a big first wave, a smaller second wave. That's what the models were predicting. In Europe, we're seeing a much bigger second wave, uh, same in Western Pacific. But then in Southeast Asia, you've never moved out of the, really out of the first wave, same in the Americas, it's basically plateaued and a very different shape in Africa as well. So clearly what we're seeing now is a big resurgence, particularly within Europe and the Americas. We had last week nearly 2.3 million cases, nearly 40,000 deaths globally. And every single one of those obviously is a tragedy. But the number of cases reported in Europe almost three times higher than the first peak in March. And uh, if you look in the Africa region where we've had, I guess, relatively positive news to date, uh, 
we've had a substantial rise in deaths, something that we hadn't seen before, 27% um, increase compared to the previous week. Uh, there are uh, reports of lower mortality in Europe versus March. Clearly, it's, if you talk to frontline health providers, both in North America and in Europe, clearly we, we know better what to do. We know better what to expect. We know how to manage. We've got dexamethasone and other um, approaches that are that are better at managing severely ill patients and people are more conscious about when they need to get to the hospital or not. But right now in many countries, Switzerland included, France included, Spain included, Italy included, we all, if you talk to ICU providers, they are very concerned that they're getting to the that tipping point where it's impossible to manage safely anymore. So um, particularly across Europe, you see some of the countries here uh, on the right that have had big uh, uptakes, particularly in the Czech Republic, but also uh, Austria um, and, and other countries there. Uh, there's at least uh, 30 countries, um, uh, 49 countries reporting an increasing trend, um, 30 countries reporting a greater than 50% increase. And COVID-19 is now the fifth leading cause of death in Europe, even perhaps higher in North America than the US as we've as been reported elsewhere. Um, and the mobility data that we're seeing from colleagues at Google shows that we're really back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, it's quite clear that some of the countries that got down where they only had a few cases a day in the summer, the uh, people were moving around for their summer vacations in, in big numbers. Now we are about to head into, and we haven't yet formally, the seasonal influenza time, where you have co-circulation of influenza and COVID-19. And I can personally say that um, with a, a daughter in school and coworkers who have had uh, uh, my daughter's schoolmates, but also coworkers who've had flu-like symptoms, but have not had COVID, it creates havoc for people having to stay home, miss work, miss school, people having to be uh, de get tests, other uh, and potential contact tracing then happening. So uh, one of the questions we've been asking in the number of countries is actually flu rates for this same time. Um, uh, in previous flu seasons are down significantly. So there's two things to consider there. It, there's a strong possibility that some of these measures that containing COVID-19 are being very effective at containing flu and perhaps are more effective at containing flu than they are at containing COVID-19, interestingly. And there's clearly some uh, co-immunity as has been termed um, with uh, some coronaviruses circulating, for instance, in, in Africa, there are uh, four strains of coronavirus circulating that may be increasing immunity levels for, for uh, people to COVID-19. So this is something to be watching, but um, WHO recommending influenza vaccination for five target groups, pregnant women, uh, people with uh, underlying health conditions, older adults and health workers and children. And uh, we have it running right now at the WHO. So please get out there and get your flu vaccine uh, wherever you uh, can. And I think there's a big challenge around the influenza vaccines and the demand for it um, may be outstripping supply in some countries with the pressure on, on the supply chain that's there. But our, our uh, strategic advisory group of experts on immunization has recommended, uh, made some recommendations related to influenza vaccine and also continuing routine immunization for others uh, that are, uh, that uh, for other vaccines that are there. So, some of the challenges that have been faced by uh, health systems during COVID-19, uh, which are presented here, the WHO and the UN system have come together with a set of plans that we've talked about uh, before uh, with the uh, foundation uh, that bring together really a set of key actions and specific uh, directions for uh, disease, how to manage different uh, health services for different diseases. Um, and that is something that is presented in our strategic preparedness and response plan as the pillar nine of the work on essential health services and systems. That's also um, reflected in the global humanitarian response plan, what's known as the GHRP. So that's for countries uh, that are in uh, fragile and humanitarian um, assistance uh, situations, as well as the UN framework for the socioeconomic response to COVID-19. And actually we had a very, very good presentation just yesterday from our colleagues from Europe in our regular uh, meeting every morning that we have on our situation meeting, uh, looking at how they are basically bridging their, their COVID response work into longer term socioeconomic response and trying to strengthen economies. And the whole approach takes a health first approach. And 
unfortunately, there are many countries that that have somehow missed that message around the health first approach to their socioeconomic recovery and are struggling with uh, uh, being able to reopen safely businesses, schools, and other elements of the economy. So at the heart of that is really this thinking that uh, primary health care and, uh, and a primary health care approach, which is something that WHO has advocated dating back to 1978, but kind of re- uh, established or re-emphasized with a major conference at the, in Astana, Kazakhstan, uh, now uh, Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan, um, uh, uh, back in 2018, looking at particularly the focus on the primary care and the central public health function. So those public health functions that are about and strengthen our ability to, to detect and respond to pandemics as being at the core, but being supported by multiple sectors. So not just being a health issue, but but also uh, transport and energy and other sectors being there and serving empowered communities. So all of those are basically the key ingredients to strong pandemic response as it is to longer term uh, really serving people's health, uh, health needs. So that idea of the of THC and URC are, are part of um, the idea behind setting a foundation for uh, the access to COVID tools uh, accelerator, which is a big effort stood up to bring partners, the different organizations uh, uh, who work in global health around the table to try and respond to the demand on vaccines, demand on therapeutics and demand on diagnostics and ensure that all countries have access to that. So that we, we all said, well, look, if these are gonna go into countries and be sustainable, they need to have a health systems connector that is based on a PHC and, and UHC uh, approach. And this slide uh, summarizes some of the some of the needs that we anticipate: two billion vaccines, two hundred forty-five million courses of therapeutics, and, and five hundred million uh, tests uh, to be needed by mid uh, twenty twenty-one. So, uh, and within the Act Accelerator as a global mechanism for for taking that forward, strengthening health systems is really focused around seven work streams and it goes from uh, areas of health financing and engaging the private sector to data management, uh, uh, engaging communities in the response, ensuring there's protection for frontline health workers and strengthening clinical care systems, as well as ensuring the supply chain is supported uh, to deliver all of that. So there's a facilitation council that works on this and see there on the left, the set of organizations who take part uh, in the ACT Accelerator and, and help lead on the different pillars as well as the, the work on the, on the Health Systems Connector. Um, you'll see the WHO logo present in everything. So uh, without, um, anyway, uh, sort of pointing out the obvious, um, our, our team is uh, quite a bit stretched to be working on all these different areas, but of course WHO is um, the, one of the places that has the expertise to be able to provide technical backup to all of these very operational partners that we work with. Um, to give you an idea about what we know is happening in countries uh, on uh, the essential health services, primary health care, and how safe, safely we're able to keep going with services. Uh, and we've talked about this before that we have set up special efforts on looking at the continuity of essential health services. And it, I think, shows it's both a, a positive but also shows the weaknesses that we have with routine health information systems uh the periodicity and and how sensitive and how quickly they can give you information on these types of things is just not uh, there so this was a special survey we worked on uh as part of the who response um looking at the impact on the pandemic across a range of 25 essential health services and uh, we got responses back from 105 uh, countries with more probably uh, to come in our next round that we're going to be instituting later this year. But more than half of countries have limited uh, or have suspended outpatient, inpatient, and community-based service delivery platforms. And also mobile clinics are, are impacted. So you can see a wide uh, range of major, major interruptions in services. And if you look here across the a big range of service areas, everything from routine dental services and routine immunization all the way to emergency surgery and urgent blood transfusion, major interruptions. Overall, 50% of health services across the world, if you were to look at this, uh, have been uh, severely or partially uh, disrupted. And 
routine immunization interrupted uh, up to 72 percent. But uh, if you look at uh, other uh, important um, services, such as urgent uh, blood transfusion um, and then uh, management of, of severe malnutrition, perhaps slightly less interrupted, but a big, big impact on morbidity and mortality and really things that should not, you would never imagine being uh, interrupted. Um, the countries that have come up with plans for this um, are sort of increasing, but still behind what we would hope for. 68% of countries had, had defined a, the, an essential health services package to be maintained during the COVID uh, epidemic. Um, and upper and uh, middle and high income countries are much more commonly um, uh, allocating uh, additional government funding, but big gaps in terms of uh, funding for those services in uh, low income and, and lower middle income countries. So how we'll be tracking this going forward will be through a set of harmonized tools that will be based now that we've looked at the national level. We will be repeating that survey in the coming months uh, and probably targeted for next month. Uh, but we're also now getting down to the health facility level. It's quite clear that we've got a reasonable idea of at the national level about what's happening, but you know, are the supplies that have been procured really getting to the front line? Are health workers really getting the PPE they need? And do they have the equipment that they have? So we have a set of hospital readiness and case management capacity tools uh, for COVID-19, as well as a set of tools around the continuity of essential health services. And those three around the survey that I just mentioned, also survey on medicines, diagnostics, uh, and supplies for essential health services and then a community needs assessment that's being developed with Gavi and, and UNICEF. Um, this gives a bit more detail on some of those, the, the, the information that's gonna be collected there, but the modules uh, uh, are really looking at capacity and readiness and um, online applications are already being uh, developed uh, and several of them ready for deployment. And we have a set of countries that we've envisioned where those will go. I'll just finish before coming back to you, um, Donna, and for some questions perhaps, with the, the idea that a lot of this has come together, uh, especially with yourselves around World Patient Safety Day, which we celebrated 17th September. Here you see some of the amazing pictures that we have of the monuments around the world uh, in honor of that day being lit up orange, the color of the World Patient Safety Day. And uh, the theme this year was really focused around the, the, the important aspects that COVID-19 has, has reminded us of, which is that safe patients come when you have safe health workers. And so this is a, a linked uh, element that, that we really emphasized in the, in the press conference we had that day and a big online global event that we had that day and then in a Facebook Live event. But globally, around 14% of COVID cases reported are among health workers. Or, We've had some recent analysis with more full data that looks at a little bit more recently and sort of the latest uh, data, and it looks like it might be getting closer to 10%. So uh, clearly we're doing a bit better job um, uh, with overall uh, globally around preventing infections in health workers, but in some countries it's been as high as 35%. And clearly that's far, far too high for uh, a disease that we can be preventing um, uh, spreading in nosocomial fashion. So we launched a charter on health worker safety and we've really invited all countries, hospitals, clinics, and partners to endorse and implement. And you can see the five key actions there, all of which are ones that, that in different levels of the health system, people can sign up to and really advance. So with that, maybe I'll just kind of wrap up and uh, we can uh, take a moment to consider some of the uh, questions that people have uh, that you have and, and also to um, uh, we can further explore any of these topics. And I'll hand back to you, Donna. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ed. That was excellent. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, can you um, first, if, if you could address the issue of schools reopening? There are, you know, obviously lots of parents who are concerned about the safety of their children going back to school. So can you talk to us a little bit about what parents can do to make sure that um, that their children are safe when they go back? Yeah, and it's um, I think, and I've said it on with you before that I think when this is all done eventually, um, knock on wood, 
that one of the things we will really have uh, perhaps globally, not WHO necessarily, but including WHO, we'll all go back and say how we really misunderstood how important schools are, school teachers and schooling are in not just the lives of our children, obviously the education of our children, but in keeping societies functioning. We, they have now moved into a, a part of our society that I don't think anybody really fully understood. Perhaps um, my um, mother-in-law, who's a um, uh, you know, retired uh, third grade uh, school teacher, she pro probably she understood it and probably all the school teachers out there understand it. But anyway, all the rest of us missed it in a big way and we should have really been um, moving more quickly for, with a more robust uh, plan, I think, at national and global levels. But that said, um, right now there's a lot of discussion and it's um, the, around what's the right approach on schools, and there's a big variability across countries. Clearly, it's very, very dependent on local epidemiology and local uh, context. If there is a major uh, spread in the community, um, it's very difficult to, to fully, fully reopen schools. Um, but I think the consensus has grown that, uh, that this needs to be one of, if not the top, but certainly with uh, essential health services needs to be one of the top priorities for, for trying to remain open safely um, and having uh, the basic approaches then all still apply. So trying to manage the number of people who are in any given space at a time. So you can try to create as much uh, spacing as possible using uh, masks, um, uh, certainly where the, in, when the crowding and, and as we move more inside, even now in the Northern Hemisphere, most schools are almost 100% inside. Uh, and then trying to really engage young students, even uh, down in the primary school age, to really understand the importance of hand hygiene uh, and of themselves uh, as responsible, you know, sort of members of their family and their society and their community to try and reduce uh, the spread. Um, certainly it's not just about the schools, but it's also about school aged children and, and the gatherings that they can, uh, particularly in secondary school have. So that those types of messages are really important. Thank you. Well, you mentioned masks for children going to school. You know, we, we see on social media, there's quite a debate about masks. Um, you know, there are some folks that think that they are necessary and, and, and wear the, and, and here in California, there are, there are cities who have a, a rule that when you are outside of your house at any time, you must wear a mask. So can you talk about, you know, the, the disparity there between the folks that say you don't need it at all and those that say you need it every minute that you're out of your house and where, where the realistic middle might be? Yeah. Um, the basically, uh, you know, WHO has had uh, uh, advice on masks that we are now, and, and this goes for everything that we've been doing in the, the outbreak, and this is true of many of the scientific agencies that give advice at the national level, um, where there's constant assessment of the evidence that's coming in. And I've said this, uh, we've said this together, Donna, before, but the whole point is that this is a novel virus. So it looks like some other viruses, like other coronaviruses, like other um, droplet-borne uh, viruses, but it's new. So there's many, many things, therapeutics and, and transmissibility, et cetera, that we are still studying. But from what we know now, uh, it's the virus, uh, our position on uh, transmission, um, uh, has not changed. We have a, um, a scientific brief on this on, that came out on July 9th that people can see on our website. And it's the same. Uh, there's no new evidence since then that has uh, changed uh, anything. And um, in terms of uh, the advice on wearing masks, definitely it makes uh, sense when you can't uh, be physically distant from uh, other people, whether that be in public transport or be in a school situation uh, where there's um, more people uh, than the spacing of one to two meters, um, or even in a work uh, environment. Um, and uh, for instance, now WHO itself has recently, although we've just adjusted on our approach on, on the number of staff in the building, uh, because we've had more and more people in, said it would make sense to have be wearing masks in the public uh, space areas, such as the cafeteria and, and other places. 
particularly now that um, we're moving back inside and relying on, on interior ventilation. So um, for WHO, our position on uh, masks has developed, but it hasn't changed, if I can put it that way. Thank you, that's a very good way to put it. Uh, one, one last question for you. Another thing that we see on social media is a movement for uh, to just proceed with herd immunity, let the virus wash over the community and, um, and not wait for a vaccine. Um, can you talk about, uh, about what that would do if, if we took that approach? Yeah, um, well, just to back up, let's, let's take the idea here about what herd immunity is. It's a concept that according to which a, like a population can be protected from a certain virus if a threshold of a vaccination is reached. So this is um, one of the basic sort of first things that I studied at public health school at Johns Hopkins when I was there. And we looked at it vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, the measles uh, vaccine. So herd immunity would be reached against measles that requires about a 95%, 95% of the population to be vaccinated. And then the remaining 5% would be protected by the fact that measles won't spread among those who are vaccinated. But um, folks that are proposing that we could reach herd or population immunity, it's, it's a little bit turning the concept on its head because um, the, the idea is uh, around trying to reach a threshold with a vaccine. So already that's sort of a different way to think of it. Um, and we really don't fully understand the implications of letting this virus run freely. First of all, is um, a dangerous virus running freely like this is simply unethical. Uh, it's just not an option because there are uh, such a range of vulnerabilities who would be collateral damage in that uh, push towards herd immunity. And we don't also understand, as we were saying, this novel virus about how strong or how long immunity lasts. So we've already heard of reinfection. Uh, they seem to be rare, but, but that's something we'll have to find out because there's not so many people in terms of percentage of the populations, even in hard hit countries, only 10% of the population has been infected. So there may be many, many more people who are able to get reinfected. Um, so the, that type of uh, issue on seroprevalence is there. And then third, we still don't understand the long-term health impacts among people with COVID-19. There has been a lot of discussion at WHO and in, in other form about what's called long haul COVID or the post COVID syndrome. And even people with very mild symptoms or who got very mild infections and assumingly people with, uh, who are promoting herd immunity ideas feel that you know, sort of mild symptoms are not such a big deal. Actually, those, there are many people who have long lasting uh, effects from those mild symptoms. So for all three of those ideas, besides the, the ethical considerations, herd immunity uh, as a protection at the population level is a bad idea. Well, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Um, I think those are all of the questions that we have for now, but uh, as always, I'd love to have you back and in a, you know, several weeks to give us another update, if that's all right. Yeah, I'd be happy to do it, Donna, and, and uh, happy to link in with the foundation uh, anytime. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Ed. We appreciate you being here, and everybody have a wonderful day.